this is AI Ascendant, uh, take two. Um, I, the way I, I see a smaller group this time, but we have a few recidivists. <laughs> Heaven help you. Um, uh, I'm Steve Lohr, I'm the moderator of this, uh, the panel. Um, and my job here is to uh, introduce the panelists and uh, start things off. And I think uh, the, with the level of questions we had last time, we may actually cut our por portion off earlier and, and open it up to questions. But uh, let me move on to introductions. Uh, to my far right is Tom Dietrich, uh, the president of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. He's a professor at Oregon State University. He's a pioneer in, uh, in the field of machine learning, uh, both on its, its essence, its methods, and in many of, ap of, ap of its applications, including in the environment recently with computational uh, sustainability. And of course, Tom, we gave the uh, uh, final lecture this morning on uh, uh, that sketched out the both the progress of uh, 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 artificial intelligence and his line in the sand, which is autonomy, um, and his definition of it. Uh, to my immediate right is Hadas Kresskazit. She's a, a robot tamer uh, from Cornell University. Um, she's the head of the Verifiable Ro Robotics Research Group there, and uh, focuses on both uh, uh, communicating with uh, robots and trying to control them. Uh, the communications are things such as translating high-level commands like uh, search the room and it, you, so you, and the, com the robot would understand that this does not mean five paces forward and a 30 degree turn to the right. And on, the, on the control side of this, this is trying to make uh, uh, robots do what they're told to do and that we can do, find verifiable and testable ways of making that happen. Um, on my left is Yolanda Gill. Um, she's a scientist and professor at the University of Southern California's Information Sciences Institute. Knowledge capture and intelligent systems are two of her expert areas of expertise. Um, she's working on using AI techniques uh, in support of uh, data intensive science. Um, and uh, she's also an expert and has a deep interest in uh, what is known as trust and provenance, uh, following the path of automated decisions all the way back uh, uh, to the data, the heritage of the data itself. Um, and she initiated and chaired the World Wide Web Consortium's uh, Provenance uh, Working Group. On the far left is uh, Trevor Darrow of the University of California at Berkeley. He is a uh, computer vision and deep learning guy. Um, he's, uh, he's a, it's a, his work has been applied to robots and other vehicles um, and is using vision to give uh, robots hand-eye coordination at, in a more gr kind of granular level. And again, uh, from a conversation with him, his, uh, uh, his path toward robotics is uh, uh, a more uh, discrete and focused one, uh, less of the kind of uh, robots that see us face to face, but uh, ones that are more focused on individual tasks in many cases, and one of the tasks he'd like to have a robot do is clean up his backyard and his, uh, and his porch. Um, I thought I'd start out with, um, just by way of perspective, um, uh, reading something that was uh, written by a prominent uh, computer scientist. And it's, uh, in designing software and microprocessors, I never had the feeling that I was designing an intelligent machine. But now, a new idea suggests itself, that I may be working to create tools that will enable the construction of the technology that may replace our species. How do I feel about this? Very uncomfortable. Uh, the writer was Bill Joy of uh, Berkeley Unix and uh, Sun Microsystems uh, fame and his, what do you, you know, the sentences were from an 11,000 word essay entitled, Why the Future Doesn't Need Us, and it was published in Wired Magazine in April of 2000, more than 15 years ago. So the concerns we've heard recently from the likes of Stephen Hawking and uh, Bill Gates and uh, Elon Musk uh, uh, summoning the, <coughs> the demon uh, are not new, but the context changes and the, and the technology progresses. Um, and uh, there's a great debate about the, the, the trajectory and the progress of that technological development. So we've, I thought what we'd start out with is a little bit of level setting. We'd have each one of the panelists describe um, what would constitute a really big win in their field of research in the next five or 10 years, um, and then what practical effect that would have or might have uh, in terms of opening the doors to new possibilities. So, um, and it was asked to uh, keep it 
brief if possible <laughs> compared to the first run. So uh, we'll start with Trevor on the left. All right, we'll be brief and I'll, I'll do two very brief ones. One more in computer vision, more in the near term, which is we have already these uh, amazing algorithms that can detect specific things like cats, people, dogs, buses, planes, tagging images. I think in the next three to five years, we're gonna see much uh, richer uh, uh, powers there. We, right now, we can barely give you a sentence which is a gloss of a scene. I think we'll be able in five years to have much richer explanations of what's going on in an image or a video um, and to answer questions that are very detailed. Um, you know, what kind of glasses is the moderator wearing? What style of glass? Or how many people are sitting on, on, uh, on the podium? And so on and so forth. So beyond just tagging and giving us a, a kind of a, a, a high level summary of, of media, but really digging in and, and answering precise questions. And then going forward beyond that, I'm really excited to collaborate with uh, robotics colleagues at Penn and, and elsewhere on the direct connection between perception and action, revisiting classic ideas from decades ago when perception and control were, were really coupled in their academic study. They've been split apart for, for many years or decades. Deep learning and other algorithms are bringing them back together. And I think we're going to see much more agile, reactive, and responsive robots when we have unified systems that can be trained end to end. Um, ultimately, it would be great to have language and other sensory modalities in the loop as well. But that, that vision to robotics connection is the one that I'm most excited about in the near term. And it will allow robots that are very useful in the house and in the backyard. <laughs> so my focus is on uh, applying AI techniques to help scientists be more efficient and, and improve their capabilities. Um, I've done a lot of work on intelligent workflow systems that organize data analysis steps so that the systems can help scientists validate or, or um, create correct workflows. Um, uh, a new direction that we're following in the near term is to build intelligent scientist assistants. So these are able to do meta reasoning over many, many workflows that they're running and tell the scientists what's interesting about their results. This is new work that is um, funded by DARPA DSO. Um, in longer term, what I see is that scientists are very good at their compartmentalized field. So what they're facing is big problems that require very integrative research across areas, but they don't have very good ways to map the information and the knowledge within an area into other areas. So for example, I work with researchers that are looking at the age of water in an ecosystem. How long does a drop of rain stay in the ecosystem and where? And they'll have an expert in uh, lake models, an expert in the river model, an expert in the vegetation, an expert in the fisheries, and it's kind of hard for them to communicate. So I think AI systems have a big role to play in making science more um, map through these scientific expertise areas through knowledge rich um, uh, knowledge maps that, that help them do more integration across science uh, specialties. So I'm interested in robotics and specifically how to make uh, a robot system do complicated and interesting tasks uh, semi-autonomously or as, as autonomously as possible. And one of the things that, that we lack right now, and we have a, a good knowledge about how to do very specific things, so uh, maybe perception, some actuation, some motion planning, some all, all these uh, basic components, but we don't have a good way of characterizing when these um, basic components, uh, under what conditions they fail, when did they uh, behave well, when should I compose this component versus that component, and um, a, 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 an impactful um, technological advance that hopefully will happen in the next few years is to take these components and reason about when should we use them and when should we not use them and w when, you know, and, and whatever confidences we have in them and then have ways to automatically compose them in a way that allows everybody to, com to now program a robot. So right now, people don't program robots. Uh, PhDs in, in electrical engineering, computer science, or mechanical engineering program robots. And uh, to be able to, to create these systems that anybody can, can work with, anybody can interact with, we need to, be, to have that ability to compose these components in a way that we know what's going to happen. So we know that if, uh, um, if it's raining outside, maybe I don't want to use this controller, but I want to use that controller. And having that ability to characterize these components also allows us to provide feedback to people. As, uh, for example, um, if you have a self-driving car, 
we know, we all know that uh, perception does not work well in snow. So a self-driving car will tell you, you know what, now you need to take over because now it's starting to snow or, or something like that. So uh, having those components and big guarantees, uh, real guarantees that we can provide about them uh, would, would make robotics a lot more accessible, a lot more uh, reliable, a lot more predictable uh, for the future. So I'm also going to, uh, as with Trevor, uh, talk about two, two different things. Um, so the first is that I've been doing quite a lot of work in anomaly detection, uh, mostly with applications in computer security, but also uh, more generally looking at the question of how a system can work well when, it's, uh, when, w in, when it faces unknown unknowns. So as, as a, one of our former secretaries of defense said, uh, AI went through three phases. The first phase was studying the known knowns. In the 1960s and 70s, we studied chess and checkers, things like this, that were completely deterministic systems and uh, uh, with, with no uncertainty at all. Then we moved into uh, probabilistic systems. And so from uh, around 1984, maybe, until the present, there's been a huge uptake of probabilistic techniques in artificial intelligence. And, and where we can say, well, we don't know the values of these variables, but, but we can reason about them probabilistically. But I think now, uh, as, as we start to field systems uh, that, that have AI in them, they need to behave robustly even if the designers forgot to include certain things. If certain variables are missing, if certain sensors fail, uh, how can the system work well when there's something going on that it doesn't know about, that, that, was, that was forgotten in the system design? Um, and one possible approach to that is uh, uh, to, to have a system uh, constantly be monitoring itself and looking for anomalies in its own behavior or in the behavior of the environment or other people and saying, I've never been in a system, uh, in a situation quite like this before. I don't know what's going on. So again, maybe I'll ask the, uh, the human to take over. Uh, so, so a big advance uh, that I would like to see is if we really had a, a sound theoretical basis for anomaly detection that would tell us uh, when is it possible to do and how well? When is it really not possible? We don't have any, we have a lot of algorithms, but we don't have really any theory. The other thing that I, w that I do a lot of work in is uh, working in ecosystem management problems, such as managing an invasive species or managing wildfire. And, uh, and this is similar also to problems that happen in, in managing the power grid or the highway network or any, any kind of spatially distributed system where at any given point in time, you can take action in many different possible locations. And the problem is that there's a combinatorial explosion of possible actions you could take, combinations of actions you could take, and we don't have any efficient algorithms for the, uh, choosing optimal courses of action under those conditions. So uh, I don't have a, I, I, there's no method I know of, but if someone were to hand me a, a solution to that problem that was practical, we could do amazing things, I think, in terms of of uh, much better management of our ecosystems, of our power grids, and so on. Um, so so that, those, are, those are my dreams. I, even though we did it the first time, I think I'll do it a little bit again in a shortened version. I mean, I want to push a little bit on this notion of autonomy, Tom, um, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, you had the distinction between AI tools and AI, uh, uh, what's AI autonomy. And, Again, as, as the tools get better um, and we rely more on them, don't they shape what we do? Or is, is there a concern with becoming too dependent on them? Or is that a good thing? I mean, you know, these are augmenting our performance. Um, um, and we should just simply rethink what it means to be human um, in every way, shape, and form. Interacting with them, whether they're intelligent systems like, you know, like her, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which uh, Larry Smarr says is you know, uh, coming in 10 years, and it was set in 2025, uh, perfectly appropriate. Um, or, um, you know, augmented intelligence that you, know, you can put in yourself, or, um, or prosthesis, you know, partly robotic prosthesis devices that uh, enhance your physical performance. Um, you know, how should we think about these things? Well, I don't know. Um, how do I think about them? I guess I, I feel that I am uh, uh, more knowledgeable, at least, maybe smarter, uh, because I have access to Google. Uh, I can certainly look things up a lot better, and I can make more informed decisions. Um, I guess it does lead to fear of, of missing out and things like that. Uh, um, 
uh, because I'm more aware of a broader uh, set of events that might be taking place than I ever would have been before. Um, so on balance, I love having the, the internet and, and, uh, because, and, and as I mentioned this morning, I mean, Google is built on a whole uh, collection of, of artificial intelligence uh, substrate. Uh, and it's probably the number one way that, that, we, that we all benefit from AI these days. Uh, I, I guess I, uh, I'm looking forward to having uh, additional cognitive prostheses or cognitive uh, enhancements, um, especially as my memory gets worse with time. And computers are very good at memory at remembering things. Um, so so I, I, I think I'm, I would embrace most of those uh, improvements. Certainly anyone who's, who's gotten a, you know, second, third, fourth generation prosthetic limb is very happy uh, that they're not uh, having what we had in 1960, so. And, and, and Trevor mentioned in the earlier session, I mean, this is, you know, as we work with technology, um, you know, it always changes us, changes our brain. I mean, this was the kind of, you know, the, the, the oral tradition, it's dying, this business of the written word. People will not be able to remember the way that, and I'm sure that if you, you know, the functional MRI at Socrates, you know, it, 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 he, if you could do it back then, you would see that, that, that the memory portion had deteriorated and other things picked up. Is there anything to fear here or not? Trevor, go ahead. Uh, there's, I mean, I'm sure there are always things to fear, but as uh, we've discussed, um, sometimes you want to fear the unknown or fear the uh, fear of discovery. And I mean, I, I don't personally fear uh, AIs coming to take us over any more than I fear aliens coming uh, to take us over. And I may fear both of those a small amount. Um, <laughs> and um, I you know, put my defenses in uh, uh, creating infrastructure that's resilient to being taken over by some ascendant AI. Uh, the same way I would put uh, defenses in, in our infrastructure to prevent semi-autonomous networks of computers and hackers uh, trying to take them over and do bad things, which you know is already a present threat that the government is investing in. And I think we have ideas about how we should, should approach that. So um, I'm more excited about the future of AI technology than, than scared of it. Are we going to be augmented? <laughs> in, 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 certainly we are. But in, I have in, no doubt. in, way, yeah, in ways that, um, um, well, that at least stretch ourselves in terms of you know, what we think it is to be human. Yeah, I, I certainly believe so. And I think that we're going to move into a universe of very fluid um, boundaries between human and machine. So we are all attached to our phones. This is what we do all day, right? Mm -hmm. So you're can't be more attached to, to some technology. So I think we'll see over time that um, there will be more and more intelligent machines around us. Some of them will have narrow uh, scope. Some of them will have pretty broad scope. Some of them will be more autonomous. Some of them will be more cooperative. And I think we, we need to start thinking very seriously about the legal framework for these entities that are intelligent and make decisions and act in the world. So. Um, that's a conversation that we need to perhaps have with legal scholars. I don't know, we are technical people and I don't think about these things every day, right? But certainly there, we have legal frameworks for um, whether I'm responsible for my children's actions, right? And then my children grow and at some point they become these autonomous legal entities. And I don't sign contracts with DARPA. My university is the legal entity that signs contracts with DARPA. So there's entire frameworks of what makes a legal, accountable entity that can take actions and, and make decisions. So we have to start to um, develop this legal framework for intelligent machines. We are going to need it. Who, me who mentioned the idea of autonomous cars that being corporations or trusts? Yeah, or I was mentioning that's that. That's nice. Idea, so yeah. maybe, maybe each robot is its own little trust <laughs> <laughs> or something. Well, that also, I mean, touches on this, one of the notions that was, uh, things that was presented this morning about, you know, don't let pundits do it, yeah. let premiums do it. Is anybody, this is kind of, that one I hadn't heard of, <laughs> you know, which was a, a sort of, you know, market forces, uh, you know, um, what do you think of that, Tom? Oh, I strongly agree. Uh, yeah, I think that um, uh, it's, it, it, it's better to, to, uh, uh, for instance, suppose someone is, is, uh, is harmed by a self-driving car. 
Um, we, they don't want to wait to, to have their medical bills paid while the l system litigates uh, whether it was the programmer's fault or the manufacturer's fault the or the driver's fault or someone else's fault. Uh, instead, uh, I think they want to be able to uh, get paid by the insurance that the car carries. And then the insurance company uh, b starts to build over time uh, experience and finds out, oh, well, it turns out uh, people like this, they misuse their self-driving cars. They turn up the aggressive knob too far. And so they have to pay higher premiums. Or maybe it's uh, software produced by those guys at Oregon State. Uh, they, 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 we can't trust that anymore. So anybody who uses that, they're going to have to pay premiums on that. So, so I think uh, that's probably the most uh, utilitarian way forward, I guess. Uh, and, and because we benefit from the gift of English common law, we, we probably can do that in our legal system. If Napoleon had won, and we were speaking French now, uh, we'd have to actually figure out who was at fault, and that would be uh, much more painful. Any other thoughts on the, on the insurance notion? So I think um, one of the things that we can do with technology is track the provenance of decisions, and through provenance, make the systems more accountable. Uh, and decide or maybe at least characterize whether there's people or institutions or entities or machines that are responsible for certain decisions and where do we want to put the responsibility and the accountability. So, um, so I, I started to get interested in provenance. You mentioned the work that we did on this um, uh, through the DARPA high performance knowledge bases and rapid knowledge formation programs that, that Dave Gunning here um, uh, was the PM for. So, so we would develop these very sophisticated um, approaches to uh, intelligent systems, very knowledge rich systems, and our users kept asking, you know, well, how does it know that? Why does it do that? And so it was clear that the system was very intelligent, but they wanted to understand how to trust it or how, you know, how is it making those decisions? And so uh, there, it was important to them to see why the system knew what it knew, right? So if you told it, you know, it will say, how did you decide this estimate for this course of action? We would say, well, we followed the process in this army field manual. And then also there was this army expert that told us to use these different estimates because they're more realistic. Their reaction was, oh, okay. And they really needed to know these things, right? So, so provenance is a way to say whatever information an intelligence system is using, it comes from these sources. And so you can start to attach, you know, well, the fact that it was an army field manual really mattered because it's backed up by the army officially, the fact that it's this expert. So you start trying to track the information that individual systems use and the provenance of that information. And then you may have many of these intelligence systems and humans uh, involved in processes and decisions. So you really need to track who is, is making what aspect of the decision and how the information flows through these systems. And eventually, um, we can, based on that provenance trail, we can start to think about accountability. Is the plant operator responsible or is the company responsible or is the user responsible? So you can um, characterize the provenance and then think about accountability on top of that. I think that's an important technology for trying to tackle some of these big questions we're asking today. Yeah, and I mean, I think this came out in the earlier session, too. And I think the uh, phrasing, uh, you know, I, I kind of like Danny Hillis's formulation is that if these systems are going to work and be acceptable in society, they have to tell their story. Um, and they have, you have to find, you know, have to in some way find out, at least for the decisions that matter, the sort of high stakes decisions um, that really affect people's lives. You have to, you know, A, have a track of how, a trail, an audit trail, if you will, of how the decision is made, and um, um, be able to, you know, stop and intervene if, if you know, throw off the switch if, if that uh, is, seems appropriate. But sort of, is this sort of storytelling and telling what it does? Is that enough? I mean, the other one of the other themes that that came out from the earlier session and the the kind of metaphor that was often used was children. And evolution, and that these things are like children, um, and we have, you know, we instill values in children, or try to with mixed results, um, and and as they is is there some sort of front end, in in terms of, uh, you know, putting in values in in terms of the evolution of this technology as it moves forward, that you know, 
that it makes sense to think about in terms of developing a framework or, you know, Ten it, Commandments. It may be will. like <laughs> it may be as as uh, Tom was mentioning earlier that we 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 teach them like children by showing them many examples of ethical behavior and unethical behavior, and by them reading stories and fiction. Uh, and you know, you were mentioning Stuart Russell's interest in this and how, I mean, that's what that's what much of uh, literature may be about is lessons for um, people to draw examples from and and. It may be a more direct path to have machines literally read those stories and try and answer the same kinds of questions we would ask our kids about, you know, Little Red Riding Hood or whatever. And if they can mimic the behavior of an ethical child, well, at least we're closer than we were yeah, before. Yeah, no, it's, it's a kind of neat idea. I mean, the, uh, Stuart Russell's one, uh, one it, it, it's going to be fascinating to see what this training data is. I mean, with, with movies, that, you know, starting in the 70s, the anti-hero was king, right? I mean, so <laughs> the good guys weren't the good guys or, or, or weren't what they appeared. Um, Just don't show them Pulp Fiction. <laughs> yeah, among and many the others. others. Well, they'll have to read the movie reviews, too, <laughs> and, and maybe the New York Review of Books as well. <laughs> you know, is, is there a sli slippery slope here? And I'm going to you know, trot out this old my movie dystopia um, <laughs> analogy. That it's, you know, it's not the Terminator, it's Wally. -E. Um, that um, it's not a single event. It's um, uh, it, and Wally, of course, was the Pixar 2008 movie that uh, kind of depicted a uh, um, you know a, a comfortable hell, <laughs> um, where not only the physical uh, people's had physically atrophied because everything else did it so well for them. They also they, so did their thinking and their um, um, you know, and their ability to react and respond in, 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 in intellectually. Um, and, and the answer that kind of came back was that, you know, well, you know, we're always augmented by technology. <laughs> and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I just, you know, in terms of controls, um, what makes sense? Anybody? So I, I've been thinking about what you said in terms of Wally and, and the kind of uh, technology taking over. And Boiling and the human and frog, you know, it just slowly, you know, little by little. Yeah, but, but people find um, very creative uses of technology that whoever designed the technology did not think about, right? So uh, I don't have a, an example coming up to, uh, um, kind of right now, but... Uh, SMS, text messaging, right? But, yeah. And, you know. so <coughs> emoticons. Yeah. Or, yes. <laughs> And, and uh, um, so one view would be we atrophy and we have a, s a screen in front of us and, and we become obese and every, everybody's on a pallet and the robots do everything for us. Another maybe more uh, optimistic view of the world is we learn how to work with these systems to make, and this is actually Ken Goldberg has, uh, has this whole uh, uh, um, spiel, um, that we learn how to work with these systems and, and with these robots together to create things that we couldn't do before. So uh, uh, another example is, is, is chess, right? So Deep Blue beat the Grand Master, but now uh, teams of humans and computers together can beat uh, Deep Blue and can beat pretty much every, every, everything else. So maybe an, a, a different way to look at it is, is, is not that we are going to be, become these vegetables that everything is done for us, but rather that um, we will, again, repeating myself, but we will be able to do things that we didn't think were, were possible just because we have these extra entities helping us, taking care of some more of the more mundane tasks or some of the more, uh, even memory ca tasks or computationally intensive tasks or things that, that machines are very good at. Um, uh, you, may, you may know that, uh, you know, the about RoboCup uh, and the RoboCup competitions in which they have robots that play soccer or football, depending on your continent. Uh, and uh, one of their long term, they have this long term roadmap, and the end of that roadmap is they, in 2050, they want to have human versus robotic soccer. But I think it would be much more interesting to have human robot teams versus human robot teams. And, uh, and so the future of sport might be something like that, uh, which could be very, very interesting as well. But, but I, so I'm not sure. I mean, the people in Wally seem to be quite happy. Uh, so you, 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 up to you a look at them. Up to uh, a point. Yeah, that's right. That's you know, right. Sort of, uh, but they, you know, it's appalled, it's but. Uh, until they're given a mirror. Yeah. <laughs> right, but. I, yeah, I, Like it, and we would just kind of fade away rather than, you know, have the robots 
take over, but we would just no longer really care as long as we got our dose. And they might like it, but it would make me sad for them. I'd like to comment too. I'm rather disappointed uh, in the response we get to the question regarding what's the negative side, okay? There's no disrespect to, every, to anybody in the panel in this room. Not everybody can be a PhD. Not everybody can be a vice president of a corporation or a professor. There's, there's about what, 200 uh, working class people at this convention center. You're gonna replace them with robots? What are they gonna do when it comes time to buy food for the family? Okay, if we go to the point where we forget about the little people, okay, shame on us. And the day comes when we start replacing men and women with machines because we're gonna save a dime and so forth. You gotta think of the, of the social aspect of it too. And the gentleman you talked about how fun it would be to have a, a robotic rugby game or soccer game. What do you get out of athletics? Forget the physical part of it, but the stick to and the termination, the, the ability to, to face consequences and fight back and compete. No machine can do that. I don't care what you think. If you take away that from the human, your sorry state here. I really believe that. It really upsets me to hear that we're thinking to take things away from the human being, okay, and replace it with the machine. I work for Honeywell. When we ask passengers on a plane, God forbid if there was an emergency in the plane on our way back home, would you rather have a machine take over or a pilot with 30 years to take over? You know what the answer was? A human. And they probably are wrong, though. They might die if the human took over, right? Well, I mean, as my example was this morning, there are multiple cases where the, yeah. the humans made catastrophic errors, okay. and really, if we had better robots running those planes, there'd be a lot of people alive today that are not. <laughs> but don't, okay, but I guarantee you there would be. Force take off when, uh, when you get the, the, the wings at very low to the surface, and the, and the pilot lets the other pilot come up and you almost crash, and then he's taking his hands and take it off. Well, yeah. I, of course, we've had many of these experiences, <laughs> but, but uh, the technology isn't isn't, uh, you know, converged to its, uh, to okay, its optimum. It could be improved. Without being argumentative, I'm not going to discuss it. Yeah. Many people feel what they would rather have the pilot. This gentleman brought up about obesity. We have a program going with uh, Mayo Clinic, no slouch, believe me. You know what one of the biggest causes of obesity in children today is? Their butts are sitting home on a Saturday afternoon or on a Sunday afternoon playing with the computer and the machine rather than out there playing basketball or kicking a can around and, and, and so forth. And if we, if we take everything and, and when was the last time you walked 30 feet to your coworker's office to talk? You don't do that, you send an email. Okay, and there's a consequence for that. There truly is. This generation, and, I, and again, I, I'm a dinosaur, I'm old school, okay? How many people are comfortable talking to people one on one? I had a person tell me on a performance appraisal, can't you send me it on the computer? You know, and I said to him, you get your butt in my office because we're not gonna do a performance appraisal on a computer, okay? Because the computer was safe. And, and sorry us, when we lose that ability as human beings to be able to talk to people and because we're afraid to, and we'd much rather talk to people on a computer. So I'm just saying there are plenty of negative as aspects of just having the machine taking over to try to re replace humans or do our job or make life easier. I like talking to people. It'll be a cold day in heck if I'm gonna do a performance appraisal with, with somebody on an email. Well, I, I think it's a good point. A point one should make is that tool use has defined humanity for you know forever and bringing new tools and automation to people as they do work certainly has been something that all workers and all people have, have strived for. Whether we're hitting this tipping point where suddenly there will be no jobs, I think that is a, an important debate, but so far, historically, every time there's a new technology from the steam shovel to automation or whatever, people probably flock to jobs where they have automation to help them more than, than the opposite. And um, so. So I mean, acknowledging the, the issues that you raise, uh, which I agree, uh, you know, have applied to a lot of technologies, I, I, I'm actually worried that we'll have fear of intelligent systems and we'll miss out on opportunities to actually use them to better humanity. So um, 
you know, we just run a workshop at the National Science Foundation on AI technologies for geosciences, and the geoscientists telling us we face these huge challenges, and we can see how your ideas can help us face those challenges. And if we don't, we won't be able to understand our ecosystems. We won't be able to understand Earth systems. Um, I think that if we miss out on the um, potential of AI technologies to contribute to these big problems, um, I would worry about that. I think we need to, we need to address those. I just want one more comment. I have a, a cousin who's a child psychologist, teaches at Wright State. My grandson, four years old, you know what she brought him for a present? A hammer, a half a dozen nails, and a block of wood. And she said to him, go make something. <laughs> rather than an than a, a expensive toy that you have to press buttons and things go whoop, whoop, whoop. When was the last time you got your kid a nails and a hammer and a block of wood? It's not a bad present. Thank you. And, uh, you know, you raised beyond the social issue, I mean, the economic one, which we aren't really touching here because we, you know, don't have anybody on the panel. I mean, this is, this is the same version of the argument that, that you know, it's, it's different from a positive side. Is the, the, uh, their names escape me now, but the Oxford uh, economist and machine learning expert, uh, you know, come up with this estimate that 47% of American jobs are at risk of being automated out in the next, you know, decade or so. Um, and that's, you know, it's, again, it's, the argument is that, it, you know, look, we've ever since the Luddites and before, it's always been the case that, uh, you know, people have, you know, bemoaned the, uh, the arrival of new technology, and it's never worked, and it hasn't worked out that way in the past, but, I mean, this is, you know, a whole... There are probably uh, many uh, eras of history where you could say 50% of jobs were about to be automated in the next 25 years or 50 years. Yeah. The time scales may be changing. Yeah, so that's, and that's, that's the difference. That's I mean, you know, if, look, it, you, it used to be that, you know, more than half, you know, look, at the turn of the century, it was 70% of the American workforce was on the farms, and, and you know, yeah. now it's 3% or something, and we're still more productive than we were before and all this. But that was, that's the, you know, it's that time shrinkage that you're, I mean, and the adjustment period that is, you know, a huge issue and you know, focus of debate, and it's, and, it's a, and it's a good one. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, I mean, yes. you know, the, 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 the Industrial Revolution was also a time of great social yeah. upheaval. And, I think my answer and so is I, I think a lot of the concerns raised are, are serious ones, but, but as, as you pointed out, we don't have, we're not experts in labor economics, and, and I think that the labor economists themselves don't have a strong sense of what's going to happen. I, we, it's clearly we, not a zero-sum game, and hopefully enough wealth can get created by all these technologies and um, and distributed and portion as yeah, 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 make yeah, everyone. Yeah, that's a whole other debate. Uh, about that. We'll just have different jobs. We'll just have different jobs. There will always be, be jobs for humans. And there will be always, I disagree with Larry, I mean, humans cannot, we cannot stop ourselves from uh, challenging ourselves and thinking of new things. And I think we'll always. Uh, some yes and some no. <laughs> well, sure. Well, until people go to gyms now, okay, yeah. there might be a small group likes that fiscal labor thing for some reason other than uh, having to make a living doing that or, or digging ditches. So maybe some people will like, you know, creative It's, it's certainly true now for literature. retired people. Or my, my father does that. And, and I think, so I don't know that there's any, any harm in that. The actual well, amount absolutely. of work necessary I may be reduced. I Steve on this, okay? Mm -hmm. So in dataism, you talk about how data and analysis replace sort of intuition and and, I and those kind of in insights. Intuition experience up to a point. And, and yeah. so, <laughs> the good, is, the bad. Is there a loss in that? Is there something sad about that? Yeah, and it's also, I mean, the other side of, you know, a, 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 the shorthand here is, you know, at its best, what we call experience and intuition is really a lot of data that you can't put a crisp number on, synthesized by the human brain. And that, you know, the other side of this, I, I mean, if we're going to digress, I mean, you know, and it was the point was touched on earlier this this morning actually. But I, you know, we did a, a colleague and I, John Markov, did a, a series on artificial intelligence uh, five years ago, right? And one of the things that we, we never really wrote about it, but when you, you know, it's called smarter than you think, and it called touched all the usual bases and, and some others. Um, but you know, at the end of it, you know, you really anybody who deals in this field, I mean, you get a true appreciation for what we call general human intelligence. I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot the machines can do better, but, you know, I mean, with eight watts or whatever it is up here, I mean, it's an energy efficient processor. It's pretty hard to match. Anyway. I don't want to get too much into economics, but I want to give you a very positive view. I agree very much with what Tom said in the morning that in the end, we will have to have whatever you call quote unquote intelligent machines and humans working together. There's nothing else going to happen. 
And we just have to learn how to work on that to the benefit of, of us. But as far as all the other negatives, it is up to us to go to the gym and exercise if we say it work. It's up to us to teach our kids, our, our kids to be smarter. I teach in a university. I know how much I can do with new tools we have for education, where we can take students at their side and we can encourage them to be more ag aggressive learners and so on and so forth. Or I can give you a million of examples where these tools can only give benefits if we use our intelligence correctly. Well, why don't we throw it off? Uh, if you'd like to ask a question over here. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, so sure, uh, I'm Don Wunsch with Missouri University of Science and Technology. And uh, I, I'd like to echo what Steve just mentioned and, and Paul earlier this morning about the more that you work in this field, the more that you gain respect uh, for Great intelligence that occurs in the natural world. Uh, and, and I would extend that even to insect intelligence. I don't think we've replicated all the capabilities of flies or ants yet. And so when, uh, when some very well-known people talk about what's going to happen in 2030 or 2050, uh, I recommend a very healthy dose of engineering skepticism, <laughs> uh, uh, to, to put it mildly. Uh, but on the other hand, with tongue firmly in cheek, uh, I, I think that one can talk about systems becoming powerful enough to enslave us without having to become more powerful than us. And also the, the, the thing brought up in the earlier afternoon uh, session about replicating uh, AI, uh, maybe some of these things are already starting to happen. So uh, people have been referring to the computer games and uh, also phenomena, uh, some of the social media, uh, maybe can be very addictive for certain types of personalities which causes these companies to grow, which creates massive economic incentives to invest more money into the processors and into the AIs uh, that drive them. And so the computers uh, maybe are already enslaving uh, not just one or two humans, but millions of humans, or at least thousands of humans to, to manufacture more of them. So they don't even need to replicate themselves. Uh, they've created irreversible economic incentives for us to replicate them for themselves. It's sort of like not owning the spacecraft in order to get something into space. You don't have to own the means of production to cause the production uh, to happen. And furthermore, with replication with cloud computing, Amazon and, and some of the other services are making the computing available and you can even sign up for it for free. So you can get quite a few cycles for free and they're also, uh, like Google and some others, making AI tools available for free online, Microsoft as well. And so, uh, so maybe the pieces are falling together for some of this replication to happen. So we may get to a slippery slope. Uh, we may already be uh, sliding pretty speedily down the sli slippery slope. But even with all that happening, and I welcome it, uh, but even with all that happening, I think that we still need a heavy dose of uh, engineering and scientific skepticism while realizing that maybe things are happening that no single human uh, observes because of all the, uh, all the distributed forces that are in place making them happen. So not so much a question, but just sort of a, uh, a little thing to toss out there to, to bounce the conversation on. So I have to say, I'm excited to see intelligent machines help humans become a better version of ourselves. So we make mistakes. We can't explain ourselves. We kind of make it up as we go. We make a decision and then we explain it away. We rationalize it. We're not very logical machines. Um, as you know, you know, free economics gives a lot of examples of that. Um, we're not optimal in any way. So humans have a lot of these, you know, faults or flaws in, in, our, in our, the way that we approach problems. Uh, we have cognitive limitations. So I'm really looking forward to the machines being able to tell us, you know, oh, you made an error here. Uh, oh, you right. Trust us <laughs> with all those flaws to design machines. Uh, well, you know, my calculator works fine, and I make a lot of mistakes when I do long division, so, you know. <laughs> Hierarchical design methodology, I believe. <laughs> Explain this point. Right. <laughs> so, you know, we have, like, in the history of all mankind, um, used technology to augment human beings, right? I still remember when I was in elementary school, there used to be a Paul Bunyan cartoon, where Paul Bunyan races against a guy with a chainsaw. 
and whether or not Paul Bunyan could cut down more trees and chainsaw guys, right? And so all throughout the history of man, technology has augmented and not replaced people. So now we get in a realm where, where AI is helping us make decisions. The one thing an AI can never do is it have its own intent, right? At the end of the day, it has its own personality, what you call soul or something like that. You know, we have fantastical things where they become somehow self-aware and have their own intent. When you talk about the legalistic implications of a machine, the intent is going to be the intent that was written by the, the people who wrote or built the machines, right? And so at a point where we're saying, oh, machines are going to rise up and create their own intent, that's, that's kind of fantastical because we as creatures are pretty selfish about control, right? If you look at 99% 90, 90 of people around the world, there's going, no one's going to deceive intent to something else. That's one reason why we have so much problems with trusting machines. Like even from a trust standpoint in the, the military, right? How you know the machine's going to do is what it's supposed to do. We have often said, we just trust it like your calculator, that intent's good and it's not going to be bad. But we, we, they're not going to create their own intent, right? And that's where crime happens, that's where litigation happens, is in the intent. Not the criminal act itself, it's the criminal intent that you get, um, you get uh, prosecuted for, right? So think of AIs as augmenting how we make decisions, how we do those kind of things. And the second thing in regards to jobs and all that and changing the economy, what I've always heard in high tech is we outsource jobs. So the jobs that are gone, are gone already, in case you guys are wondering. We outsourced jobs to China, when China became too expensive, or India, when China, India became too expensive, we went to China, when China became too expensive, we went to Vietnam. And the ultimate thing was that we would stop outsourcing when we can automate, and that'd be the cheapest way to do something, right? And that's not a bad thing because we have created a creative economy. If you look at some of the craft jobs and the craft economies, people are getting away from mass-produced products, and you see artists come back up again because they no longer have to work those factory jobs. So there's, there's a change in the economy that always happens when you have a change in technology. I don't think the economic impact of smart machines are going to replace everybody. The reality is we've outsourced those jobs, right? We have some, some jobs that are more lower level, but we are also in those jobs today, right? Heck, you know, you could argue that the majority of people that do something lower level jobs aren't even Americans anymore. There are illegal immigrants that come up, right? So those are the kind of things you got to think about when you talk about the impact any technology has on any economy, right? What's already happening in society, right? And we shouldn't be afraid of augmenting our reality, our ability to do things, because A, somehow the machines will have their own intent and rise up and kill us, right? I don't even know how to teach a machine to do that, right? And secondly, you know, society's gonna change whether we like it or not, right? People are gonna change whether we like it or not. AIs aren't gonna create societal change. Societal change occurs already. Okay? So, so you bring up an interesting point, which is that, um and I think I agree with you that the, the machines are there to do a job and then it's up to us to make judgments and decisions about how to use them. So uh, in the earlier session, I gave the example of uh, a machine translation system. So machine translation systems 10 years ago generated a lot of gobbledygook. You couldn't really make out what they were translating. Today, they're getting pretty good. So one of our uh, spin-off companies from, from USCISI, where I am, uh, on machine translation actually translates the reviews in TripAdvisor. So I use those reviews. I was looking at a particular review and it was recommending a restaurant and reading through it, it said, um, uh, that's not a good restaurant for chess. And I was not understanding it. And the reason was that it was translating, uh, you know, it was misspelling cheese as chess. So it's up to us, the humans, to decide what to do with that technology. The, the translation capability is really outstanding. I could really make out a lot of these reviews, right? But ultimately, I am accountable for how I use those translations today. So I think we have to think of uh, things in the way that the gentleman was, uh, was uh, posing it. But I would like to th uh, say that I think um, if you lose control of a system, even if you built it and it has some objective function it's optimizing, if you can't control it anymore, then it, it essentially has a will of its own. And, uh, and so the concern I think we have is, uh, could it be that we, would, that we make systems that are powerful enough that we, and then lose control of them, that we would regret that? So that's, that's I guess, my concern about 
total autonomy or independence uh, is, is that we don't want to go that far. I think we want to, we want to maintain this collaborative relationship with our creations, not, not uh, empower them to the point that, that through software errors or cyber attacks or something, we, we would lose control of them. No matter, is that true no matter what the scope of the technology is? I mean, the thermostat example, where you're okay giving up control. Yeah, but I really haven't lost control of it in the sense that at any time I can intervene and stop yeah. it, right? It's more that if it is, uh, you know, nuclear armed or something, and, <laughs> and it's been hardened because of cyber attacks so that it's impossible for me to get back inside. I mean, of course, this story has been played out many times before in Failsafe and Dr. Strangelove and so on. We had an example uh, in those days. but. But we can easily imagine that uh, in or to, by hardening our systems against cyber attack, we could also harden them against ourselves and our ability to get in there and correct a software error. That but there's made. no override for the automatic for the ABS system yeah, in my so car. There's a lot of autonomous systems for which there is no yeah. override. I, don't, I mean, I guess I have the option not to drive that car. So I just keep wondering, is it really the autonomy or is it the sort of autonomy plus the, all the other things that can go wrong with the resources that are allocated to that autonomy? Well, I guess if, uh, if we started to see ABS systems being compromised by cyber attack, you would probably one. want to have an override. Or, right? or I want so a right now they're trustable, one. but maybe that's yeah. not going to be true in the future. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. An interesting thing was raised by one of the uh, participants in the previous session who came after the panel and asked a very interesting question that I hadn't thought of, which is what if the intelligence system recommends something and a human overrides that, and the wrong thing happens, right? Right. Well, and this, this scenario has been suggested many times in medicine, right? Mm -hmm. Where, w when does it become unethical to disobey the, the robot doctor's uh, recommendation? Mm -hmm. when, when we get sued for that? Maybe quite soon. Eric Rosier from the University of Cincinnati. And I just wanted to touch back onto this ethics issue and the fear that a lot of people have. We see a lot of horror stories, I think, in science fiction, Maybe we see some in reality as new technologies are brought on and abused. But I wanted to really support the point of the panel, I think, which was that this is about human responsibility and talk more about some of the positives. So I've, I've been conducting a research study right now with SRI as part of a seedling study we're hoping to get funded in the near future. And to offer a bit of a positive point from our results, uh, I'm wearing two sensors right now that's part of an intelligence system that I've been wearing since May. Uh, I've been my own guinea pig in the study, and we're using feedback and data analysis to try to drive health decisions. And since May, I've lost 50 pounds and gone to running zero miles a day to five miles every day. So I think there's a lot of things that we can do with this to enable people who, you know, I like to think I'm a smart person. I was following NIH guidelines of 30 minutes of exercise a day. It wasn't right for me, but having personalized intelligence that we've been working on has helped me understand how I'm reacting better, to understand that it's different from what the norm, what the human intuition might be that works for 90% of people, 80% of people, I'm not even sure that we know how many. And that, I think, is the real promise here, is the ability to utilize the technology, not abuse it, to improve the human condition. And I think that we're getting there now, and it may be a bumpy road, but that, to me, is really what the end goal and the end possibility is. Can I ask a very narrow question on that one? Sure. I mean, what, is, what was the information feedback that changed your behavior, or was it something else? It was being able to watch Every, so I'm taking everything down. I'm tracking calories, tracking carbohydrates, fats, and protein. Right. I'm doing analysis on all this, clustering on my methods, feedback on daily weight, feedback on daily cardio return to rest. It's a lot of intensive data collection, which we're hoping to streamline in the future as part of this. Uh, but it was being able to get that feedback and, and see day to day the trends and what was working and what wasn't working. For instance, I had thought, well, you know, if I go out and I run on flat ground, that's the best way to improve my calorie goals for the day. Turns out it's not true. You need to, I have to add elevation. If I'm working on an incline at slower speeds, I can tend to sustain that longer and get more done in the time. So it's just been the constant feedback and knowing exactly what the outcome of precisely what I'm doing and knowing where the problem areas might have been and being able to cluster and analyze those on a very personal level. And I should say there's, there's actually several people in the study and we've all had very similar results. We're all kind of the primary investigators in this hopeful future grant, so it's a very narrow set of people who take it very seriously. <laughs> uh, but hopefully, it's the shift yeah. in the habit. I mean, zero to five miles is a pretty significant. <laughs> and, I, and I really didn't expect to get it that soon, but the data feedback really let me know what was improving cardio, what was improving speed, and everything else. Huh. So, okay. thank you. No, just. <laughs> Um, I'd like to follow up on the previous speaker and add another positive angle. 
Uh, one advantage that people have over computers is creativity. And I don't believe that people are going to relinquish that advantage anytime soon. And my hope is that as computers are able to do more and more of the things that people aren't necessarily that good at, they'll empower people to be more and more creative. I'll speak about one domain that I know about. Um, you're already seeing a revolution in music making where people in their bedrooms, on their computers, are making music with more power than the greatest orchestras and the greatest studios of years past. And if you pay attention to what's going on in the music world, they're coming up with some pretty amazing things. So my hope is that the ascendance of AI might actually lead to a golden era of, of human creativity. Uh, Sounds good to me, great, thank you. <laughs> okay. um, here. Uh, this might be not quite as philosophical as some of the other discussions, but one of the, the things that I thought was very interesting was the idea of intelligent scientist assistance. And I, I was wondering if you could perhaps elaborate on how you as a panel envision AI enhancing scientific discovery. I think that we all kind of have an intuitive sense of what can be done with uh, modeling and simulation and the idea that you can sift through large amounts of information, but it sounds like there are kind of perhaps more unusual uses for AI in just kind of enhancing overall scientific discovery. And if you could riff on that, I would very much appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I'll talk to you at the break at length. Um, there's a site, discoveringinformatics.org, where you can find a lot of ideas. But I think essentially scientists, as I was saying, have become very narrow in their expertise. So we have a lot that we can do in terms of supporting multidisciplinary and integrative kinds of simulations and models and um, are the, the systems that scientists use right now are completely ignorant. They have no intelligence. They don't know that they're looking at oxygen levels and I, they don't know what oxygen is and they don't know how oxygen is related to other uh, parameters that they're studying. So, so if we make the systems have more information about the, the physical variables that they're studying, how they relate to other physical variables, make connections across disciplines. I think this will really help us tackle the big, uh, the big scientific challenges that, that scientists find. But I can talk to you more later. An area that I've done quite a bit of uh, collaborating in has been uh, computer vision for, for small biological problems. So uh, one, another way you assess the health of a freshwater stream is to look at the population of insects, the lar larvae that live in the bottom of the stream. And uh, there are a lot of graduate students who spend their career uh, manually identifying hundreds, thousands of specimens by species, counting all that up. Or it's shellfish larvae, or it's seeds, or pollen grains, or bees, or uh, so uh, I think that uh, computer vision and especially um, being able to rapidly train a computer vision system from a small number of, of uh, examples with uh, uh, perhaps by transferring knowledge from, from other things that you've learned uh, could, could hugely increase uh, the, our ability to, to uh, monitor and measure uh, uh, a lot of these biological processes that right now are done completely manually. I'm Shelley Cazares from the Institute for Defense Analyses. And I have a question about learning. And it was prompted by one of the points that was brought up earlier today about resources, how we need to control or at least keep tabs of what resources we make available to AI systems. And so my question is, what, what really constitutes learning as opposed to, say, interpolation or extrapolation? Is it that learning requires ground truth labels to be fed back into the AI system and or, or the human system humans can learn too and and if so are those ground truth labels one of the resources maybe one of the most important resources that we have to control well um Let's see. So, so we usually define learning in a uh, kind of an operational way to say uh, we had a computer system that was able to perform at level X at time T, and then it had some kind of an experience, uh, and it and its performance improved at some future time. Uh, and that experience is usually seeing labeled training examples, for instance, uh, an input image and the output tagging that we want on that image. Um, uh, or the input uh, phrase in French and the output phrase in English. Um, 
So, so that's, so, uh, I mean, viewed sufficiently abstractly, that is interpolation or, uh, uh, from among data points. Uh, you can sort of think of it as, as sort of cur curve fitting on steroids. Um, so, uh, but that's not a terribly interesting way of looking at it, but, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but when I was talking about giving computers access to resources, I was thinking more of power, uh, explosives, uh, control of, of uh, being able to take physical ac actions in the physical world that would have life or death consequences. So that, those are different kinds of resources, the things that we would pay money for uh, now. Um, so, I mean, I, but I suppose data is a resource as well. Uh, what about, you know, AI systems learning the wrong things or learning things that are based on ground truth labels that are based on someone else's value systems as opposed to our value systems. Yes, I, I mean this is uh, uh, obviously will happen because the computer is just uh, trying to process those examples into into some rule that it can use or some function that it's trying to optimize. So the, yes, the, those are the risks. Uh, I, I, I know of some work that was done uh, quite a long time ago with uh, a credit scoring system, I think, or a loan granting system or something uh, at GE Finance in which uh, they had a committee that decided what uh, data points were allowed to be in the training set. And it was pre precisely because they were trying to prevent bias and, and obey non-discrimination laws, but, but also they realized that it was that data set that was really the specification for what was the correct functioning of that code. And unless they got that data set right, uh, so they, ha they had committee vote on every single data point, whether it was in or out. Uh, it's pretty extreme, but. M many of the uh, AI applications in, uh, especially relevant to uh, the, uh, military and national security in general would be sort of situated agents, like we saw, you know, Big Dog, you know, in the demo hall. Um, I'm sure, you know, in the next 10 years we'll have much more sophisticated uh, robots. Um, how do you actually, uh, you know, assuming that those have, you know, significant machine learning components, how do you do the uh, sort of cyber physical, you know, verification and validation that accounts, kind of as a follow-up to the previous question, that accounts for that learning? Um, you know, which is necessarily dynamic uh, in addition to, you know, what's actually programmed into the system? That's a very good question. So one, one of the, so there's a bunch of programs at NSF and uh, about how to verify and how to synthesize uh, uh, controls for cyber, cyber physical systems, robotics, or, or any, any other thing. Um, I, I don't think we have a good, good, a good answer for if you're using a machine learning approach to have, you know, you, you put a bunch of data in, you get a, a model, you get, you get a system that does something, and verifying that, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we don't really know how to do. As far, um, but if you, in terms of cyber physical systems, if you go more the control theoretic route and you, you create these systems um, uh, analytically or design them, then there's a bunch of, of tools and, and this is a growing community that's looking at verification and synthesis for those kinds of systems. So looking at, uh, you know, there are different techniques. Um, but basically looking at um, what is the envelope uh, of, of situations or what are, what are the inputs, what are the environment characteristics that it will allow you to, to say that your output or your system will behave according to some specification. So whether it be safety or whether it be liveness. So my system will never, big dog will never crash into a wall, big dog will actually move because you know, if it doesn't move, it doesn't ca crash into a wall either. Um, so there's a bunch of techniques um, that are really coming, uh, coming up from, from the controls community, from the hybrid system community, um, to, to deal with those kinds of verification and certification questions. Uh, for, for machine learning algorithms per se, for something that came out of, of, of a, a, a data intensive um, way of generating a system, those I don't, I, I don't, have a, I don't know that, that those exist yet. But that's kind of a really interesting uh, uh, research direction that, that it's gonna happen. Okay. I mean, our, our standard approach is to have uh, independent test data and test that software just like we test other kinds of software. Uh, so uh, yeah. So I right. guess I guess my point is that uh, the, the real world is sort of an open world system uh, as opposed to you know closed world systems where you're dealing in a specific context or a small number of contexts. Um, and in that open world scenario, you know, you can encounter cases where there could be you know extraneous 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 seeming factors which are not really extraneous. <coughs> because um, you don't recognize the context. 
but still, whenever you, whenever you do a whenever you verify a system, whenever you think about synthesizing something in a provably correct way or verifying it, you're always doing with respect to some specification, whether it be specification on the system behavior or specification on the environment itself, right? So I can't, I'm not going to verify that my robot will behave okay if a meter falls on it because that's not part of my uh, expected. So I mean, this goes a little bit to the unknown unknowns that Tom was talking a little bit about, right? Right. right. So this is more about validation than verification. Or uh, no. Or so it's, it's um, you will be able to provide guarantees under some constraints, right? So, so if you, you, as long as you're operating within a range of temperatures, you'll be able to say something. As long as you're operating within a certain uh, um, uh, um, slope, right? Big dog, maybe I'm, I'm sure big dog can do amazing things, but I, I doubt it can climb a, you know, an 80 degree slope. So uh, as long as you can quantify over what the, the, the you're verifying over, then you can start saying things about these systems, as opposed to uh, saying it's always going to be, uh, always going to work, it's always never going to work, and, and things like that. So I don't know if that, is that what you meant, or? Um, partially, but I, I guess the, there could just be other kinds of contexts that you don't necessarily recognize the parameters for, or the dimensions of. Agreed, agreed. And, and uh, the, the best thing you can do is verify with, with, with respect to something, because I, 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 you can't verify with respect to anything that you don't know. So maybe you can detect an anomalies. Maybe you can see that, okay, and I verify the system, and suddenly it's doing something that it was not supposed to do. Can I reason about what's going on around it, or reason about the environment, or could the conditions it's working under to, to stop and say, or have some you know, failure mode or something like that? But, um, Whenever you verify, by definition, you have to have some kind of um, representation or some kind of abstraction of what's going to happen, because otherwise it, you can't see anything, right? Any, if anything can happen, there's not a lot you can say about it. Uh, I, I, is it always plausible to have sort of a failure mode of like, you know, it's stopping entirely? Like if you're climbing a mountain, you can't just stop halfway up the mountain. Probably not. Probably depending. I mean, it's very, it's very situation dependent. You know, uh, it's very situation dependent. It's very task dependent. It's very system dependent. So, so saying something global about all systems in the world that that's difficult to do, right? So, so within within uh, with it, you brought up cyber physical systems and, and the need to be able to provide some guarantees for them. But it's always going to be within some context, right? So within within something that you can uh, that you're interested in, right? So if if I have an underwater vehicle, do I care about what it's going to do on land? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you know, maybe. The water, the water tapered off, and what is it going to do now? So, it's it's a matter of, of defining over what you're trying to say something about the system, and then being, and, and then you can um, designing failure modes, maybe for a larger set of things that maybe are less likely. But um, saying something about every possible scenario in the world, I, I, that's difficult to do. Right? All right, thank you. It's not impossible. Okay. Uh, Michael Balash from the Mito Corporation. So, in the work that I do, we. I worry a lot about bias being introduced in scenarios and in, in, uh, incorrectly interpreting the data that we're collecting to make real mission decisions on. And so I just came from the science disrupted section and they were talking about human bias and its effect on scientific progress. And then, you know, Shannon just mentioned a few minutes ago talking about scientific assistance. And then I think about the fact that when I do a Google search for something, the results I get are very different than you doing a Google search for the same thing because of the AI behind Google and it's learning my preferences. So my question is, how much do we need to worry about these AI tools causing bias in our scientific progress, in our worldview, in all these other situations, and what we might do to mitigate those bias introductions? Thank you. There, I think th it's a tremendously interesting question. and. Uh, and, and we've even seen uh, problems arise uh, uh, in, inside a company where there are two different machine learning groups that are each doing testing of, of different kinds of changes in their software. Uh, and, and as a result, they're biasing each other and, and they're not aware of it. So um, uh, I'm trying to reconstruct the exact example that was given at ICML. Um, but uh, but, but uh, there, there, there is a scenario in which uh, one group was, uh, was, was uh, manipulating um, what items would be shown as advertisements. This is a story that came out of Microsoft, I think, uh, that would be shown as ads. Uh, and a separate group that, that was uh, deciding what font sizes to use for the different ad items. And so the, uh, the first group was doing some A-B testing and trying out different, uh, 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 different prioritizations for the ads. 
And, uh, and they had done all the right kinds of tests and, and, and had validation data and so on. But the display group that was choosing the fonts was predicting which things the users would click on and the ones that were, the users were less likely to click on, it, they were shrinking the fonts. And so that interfered with the experiments the first group was doing. Both groups uh, were checking their things using independent test data and, and saw that their systems were working perfectly well. And yet, as a, the global result was a suboptimal system, deeply suboptimal system. So uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, I've looked a lot at observer bias in, in data collection. Uh, and, and of course, we need to model that bias as much as possible and, and put that in our observer model as part of the, the system. So the issue with these two learning groups is they were unaware of each other. So, and they, so they needed to have models of each other in order to correct for the, the, uh, the, the interference that was happening. Uh, and that's easy to say, but what if we have 10,000 learning components in the system and they all have to be aware of everybody else? We've just had a complete failure of modularity. We'll never be able to build such a system. So, uh, I, I, it, I, and we, we might uh, uh, hypothesize that this happens in science where different research communities, as you were saying, make different assumptions about uh, what other communities are telling them and, and, and are not aware of the observational biases underlying those experiments. And so we're, we're, we get confused as a result. So it, this this it, is a fantastic question. Uh, so I think uh, when I said before that I hope machines will make humans a better, better, a better version of ourselves, this is one of the shortcomings of humans, right? We are very biased. So um, I can tell you that um, Liz Bradley, a colleague from the University of Colorado at Boulder, um, built an AI system to uh, analyze paleoclimate data. And it turns out that she can actually uh, show the explanations that her system provides and the models that her system provides. And if you have a data set, her system will generate three models. Turns out scientists will have written papers about data set considering one model and ruling out all the others with no explanation, right? Saying, you know, mm -hmm. obviously this is the model that explains this data, right? Mm -hmm. So when she shows these um, other possibilities to the scientists, they say, yeah, I, I just didn't quite think of that. I, you know, yeah, you're right. That's completely plausible, right? And so I think, you know, I really want to see machines helping us with those biases. Um, and, and I think the more perspectives that you have on a problem, the more you can overcome them. And it's fascinating to think of machines helping us, you know, see things in different ways. Thank you. Yeah, hi, I'm Mukesh Dalal from BAE Systems. It seems to me that we are already on a slippery slope in giving control over to the machines. For example, when somebody was uncomfortable giving control to an autopilot, the response was that if the autopilot saves lives, we should give control over. So to more, some years later, if somebody is arguing that if the auto president saves life by not doing more wars or some other way, should we give control over to an auto president? What is the device stopping line from going from an autopilot to an auto president? And will we realize that in advance? I save a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think, you know, airplanes have a black box and you can see what happened, sort of. Um, so I think, you know, intelligent systems need to have this kind of record of what has been happening uh, so that we can actually understand after the fact and, you know, decide how to design them better. Yes, the auto president would be very dangerous unless uh, we had a really a tight uh, monitoring of, of that. Um, we rely on the press to do that in the U.S. Thank you. It's, I mean, this is all is uh, this sort of. It's always been my, one of my with VCs who have backed you know all kinds of you know prediction market kind of stuff. Why do you need these guys in Sand Hill Road? Menlo Bay, big fire, you know, get a good prediction market, they do at least as well, right? As opposed to, you know, what's your, uh, what's your idea, who's backing you, right? I mean, that's basically what, you know, what the, what the pit, the elevator pitch on these things is. But, you know, there's, um, there's one where I think, you know, the argument has to be for human, ex you know, the threshold before you go anywhere near that would be so high that, you know, that, you know, for the moving up to, you know, you know the CEO, right? I mean. Why not? But 
I think you, 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 we're going to run across a lot before we get to that. Um, maybe one more. Brent Dyer from Boeing. I was wondering if you have a, um, a hierarchy or taxonomy or, or um, definitions of different types, or not, not types of AI, but more or less the ascension levels. So that, because, um, and one, if not, I, I suggest doing that because the, one of the greatest fears is the fear of the un unknown and what, what people uh, have this unknown expect they, because they don't understand and if we could categorize and put labels on things, then I think it, it, it'll ease things. And know that a category such and such has such and such, and such limitations or is, is maybe even certified to be used in such and such a way and, and things like that. Once, once we put a, a clear definition on those, uh, it might help. So is there definitions like that? Ironically, we, we could tell the story of how AI is a moving target in terms of its label right. and things that once things uh, become solved, we don't even call them AI anymore. So that we call AI the things that are kind of hard to imagine how we could possibly do it and therefore scary, whereas you know automatic control systems or automatic character recognition or face recognition doesn't seem like AI, even though they could be scary. Um, so. Uh, there, there is no, it's hard to have a taxonomy other than describing the different subfields of AI that are each sometimes practicing, you know, on different types of data. Um, but we really don't have a roadmap. Uh, you know, I've always admired the semiconductor industry because they always have this 10-year roadmap of, you know, here's what the geometry is going to be and here's what the densities are going to be and here's how many billion dollars it's going to cost to build the fab and so on. And, w and in AI, we, I, we, don't have, we don't have a good enough sense of of what the thing is we're building yet uh, still. We're building all these different systems that do all these various tasks, but uh, w maybe it's just too heterogeneous for us to have a, a, any kind of hierarchy or, or roadmap for, for, what, for, yeah, for the whole field. Yeah, then people will continue to be afraid of it. So, <laughs> yeah. so there's, a, there's an episode of The Simpsons where Bart Simpson is asking, I think it was Sunday Church School or something like that, you know, they were talking about heaven, and so he starts to ask, uh, will my dog go to heaven? And so there's an answer for that. And so, you know, what about if I have a robot vacuum, will it go to heaven? <laughs> and then what if it's a robot that does this and that, right? And so, you know, the teacher's becoming increasingly more, you know, wondering, you know, these are complicated questions. And then at some point he says, you know, what about a robot with a human brain? Right? So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, maybe we can do a roadmap or do different categories, but I think, you know, intelligent systems are going to be very fluid with respect to us and humans and parts that supplement us. And you know, I, I don't see an easy way to cut clearly across types of AIs. Uh, yeah, we're, we're out of time, but let's take, I mean, we got one, two more. What the heck? I'm struck by well, the... Um, the talking about some literary examples in different spots. I'm a historian actually by training. Do you see any challenges, especially over the next 10, 20, 30 years, in regimes that are interested in controlling and not enabling their societies, employing some of these same tools we're all so happily developing with a very ideal sense of progress as always eternal? Well. Let's, let's talk about face recognition for a moment, uh, right? I mean, we have, we have uh, ubiquitous surveillance in many places, uh, and, and so with uh, face recognition, we could do a very good job of tracking individuals, and, and uh, you know, in the hands of a repressive regime, that's a, that's a huge tool. I mean, of course, we're carrying these tracking devices in our pockets right now that uh, they, they localize us pretty well. Um, so, sure, I, I think all, all of these technologies are present the huge risks. The good guys will still win in the end is the, the presumption. Well, I hope so. That's, that's our job here, isn't it? I'm a slave to my phone. Guilty. Yeah. <laughs> Me too, guilty. <laughs> okay, just one, one little final observation. I'm Jeff Paul, former DARPA PM and now with Applied Research Associates. And people come up to me, oh, what do you do? What do you do? I say, oh, we do augmented reality. We're doing augmented. So I've been kind of, that's kind of a standard response. Uh, anyway, we do a lot of different technology things for the soldier and for DARPA. 
Uh, but that term you mentioned, artificial intelligence. We, we don't do artificial intelligence, but we do augmented, re we define augmented reality as providing through visualization, providing for the soldier in a see-through system of some type. Our geo-registered icons that stay somewhere, you know, battlefield information that's overlaid over the reality versus artificial intelligence. So I would say augmented reality, augmented intelligence, I've heard these different terms used and uh, it, it seems like augmented intelligence would be enhanced intelligence. But artificial intelligence maybe is to replace the intelligence with, it could be enhanced, but augmented reality means something to the Army and to a variety of folks in the DOD community. It's putting that information out there. It's not intelligence, whatever we get, we put out there. So anyway, interesting observation. Thank you. I think that does it, so thanks very much. Appreciate you. Thank you all.